Hello, welcome to Gary Bordy Reds. Anyone who watches regularly knows I'm a bit of a fantasy Premier League obsessive, so it's great to see an episode dedicated to the game and how not in Forest feature with one of the best to ever play it in Mark Southerns, a big Reds fan. Mark, welcome back. You were here last year. How are you doing? I am delighted to be here for a second year. For one minute or more than one minute last season, <laughs> yeah. I thought I wouldn't be. So <laughs> I'm absolutely thrilled to have another chance to talk FBL with you and Forest um, before the season starts. I'm good. I'm kind of a little bit a little bit worried, I've got to say, for the pre-season so far, but um, still um, optimistic. Yes. What was the minute last season or the, the the biggest minute you thought we were screwed? Brentford away, when that goal went in, when De Silva mm. scored. I Because um, I thought we played well in that game and I thought we managed it really well. Uh, and then when they equalised, I was obviously absolutely devastated that we'd only get a point. And then when we lost it, I was like, oh. Because we obviously... We'd come through a phase where it looked like we weren't conceding back-to-back goals within, you know, 10 minutes for a while. It looked like we were, we'd have come become a more resilient side, found a formative on away from home to not only score a goal, but also to contain and manage a game. Mm. And we were doing so. And, and, and that, that, yeah, that spell. And when that, when that winner went in so late. And also that was when I detected for the first time Cooper was really down post-match. And I thought mm. it was it's a belief is a belief sapping out of him now and but you know amazing turnaround and and uh, I was at the Brighton game and the and the Arsenal game I missed I missed the Southampton game sadly but those those home matches those three home matches obviously got us over the line and it was incredible incredible time yeah Brighton was one of my Brighton was probably my favorite home game ever but apart from maybe the second leg of the playoffs against Sheffield United when we won but yeah, yeah you kind of, that was hard to beat <laughs> yeah. you mentioned games you've been at just to, um, for people who don't know you and don't watch the FPL stuff, which we'll plug, what's your forest story? Is it, is it a family thing? Because you haven't got the accent either like me. No, well, it is a family thing. Bizarrely, my my brother's, uh, my my father's brother is up at, uh, my uncle, uh, that's what my father's brother is, uh, <laughs> he's, up, he's up in Nottingham. Um, so he, my side of that side of the family is is in is in Nottingham. And they, they're, they were season ticket holders. I think they're now members. And um, bizarrely as well, it was last season. I hadn't seen them for like 20 years, uh, uh, any kind of family events and it was Swansea at home the 5-1 the Surridge hat trick that I ran into my uncle and one of my cousins um in the in the um in one of the forest uh areas around the ground and um yeah it was it was crazy to see him again and it was just it was great actually because Cooper and Cooper and that season had got me back into going to forest I was a season ticket holder but when I set up when I set up scout um, going to football was not something I could do anymore. You know, it, I was so involved in the, the fancy football world and, and the business. And um, Cooper and that season got me back going again because obviously I'm now out of the business and I had my weekends back. Um, I should have spent it for my family, really, but instead of that, I started <laughs> spending it for us. So, yeah, and then so just meeting my cousin and my uncle again after all that time and Forrest bringing us together as a family. Now we're in a WhatsApp group together and we talk Forrest all the time and, Yes, got the family or well, that, that side of the family back together. It's it's been a really nice nice thing for me to make contact with them again. And yeah, Forest was it was such a great atmosphere towards the end of that season. Obviously, you, disappointment we didn't go automatic, but then the playoffs. And um, I was lucky enough to get um, uh, I was in a a box at Wembley for the final, and uh, it was my uncle that I managed to get a, a ticket for alongside me. Mm. Uh, so I hadn't seen my uncle for twenty five years or whatever. And then there we were at Wembley together. Um, watching the greatest day in Forest, you know, time for many, many years. So it was uh, quite emotional for me to share that and to think that obviously very emotional when the whistle went and we went up. It was crazy. And last season, a roller coaster, wasn't it? Absolute mm. roller. Coaster. Um, you mentioned Scout Fantasy Football Scout that you set up. Just the good times. Give us a plug for what you do now in with in Black Box, which is one of the, the one of the ones I a podcast I watch every week. Tell us a bit about it. Yeah, so Black Box is something I just started. Um, basically, uh, there's a fellow called Az or Chaz, um, uh, Chaz Phillips, who's been in the community for a long time, and he used to do bits for me on Fancy Football Scout. He was part of the community there on my website. And then when I when I sold my share of Scout and kind of retired from the Fancy Football as a way of life, uh, or in terms of paying my mortgage, I uh, I kind of had a couple of years off, and then I thought, you know, I want to get back into it, maybe. All this YouTube stuff looks fascinating. It, it, I, I'd done a bit of that when the podcast, I did what you do. I did the podcast for Fancy Football Scout on YouTube. Mm. Um, so I had a bit of experience on YouTube, but I 
I thought, I don't really want to start from scratch. So Az had got a channel, and so I reached out to him, which was, uh, he had FBL Black Box, and we carried on and kind of revamped it a bit. And I think we're like over 100 episodes now. Yeah, 100 and something episodes. So we love it. It's a couple of hours. We get into data. We have a, a long, relaxing chat about FBL and football. And he's a Brighton fan. I'm a Forest fan. That that kind of surfaces every now and then. It's It's good fun. Is that are you still doing Wednesday nights? Are you, was it Wednesday nights last yeah, year? Yeah, it's a bit more prolific this Wednesday season. or Thursday. We're kind of ad hoc with it, really. We're kind of relaxed with it. I know that breaks the rules of YouTube and stuff. You've got to be appointments of you, yeah. I know. But they, I don't. We don't do it for like you know. It's not a. We're not making any money or living out of it. We're doing it for a hobby, really. So that's reflected in you know. We do it every week, but we don't really have a set time of day. Um, and I think that comes across in what we do. We're quite relaxed with it. Um, obviously I'd love to make more of it, but you know, I've got a day job now. It fancy football isn't my career anymore. So, yeah. You do make some money because I've seen you do eat out the sponsored ones and the manscape. Oh one yeah. Is- well, it worries me that my company is going to get that one as well. Yeah. When, when we started, um, we noticed all these other YouTubers and, and podcasts getting manscape ads, which if you don't know, that is a, shall we say a male grooming, uh, company. Yes, yeah. uh and, um, it is, um, we were like, Oh God, when we get that, when we get that, we know we've made it. So about 60 episodes in, we got, we got approached by them and we were like, yes, this is it. We've done it. And then we had to go, how are we going to sell this male grooming uh, kit to our audience? And, we had a lot of fun. We just decided to do it live and obviously we cracked up and you, you, it's very hard to try and sell that seriously, but I think we did a decent job. So it's I know I've, I've done a few ad readouts for this and it's a nightmare. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to do them live. So you're a braver man than me. So fair play. Um, you mentioned feelings about this season. We'll just mm-hmm. before we get into FPL because it kind of inform how we view forest players. You're, are, are you pretty apprehensive based on pre-season form recruitment? What's making you a little worried at this stage? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I think I made the mistake of watching other people's friendlies during the summer so far. So I've watched quite a few of the summer series and a few other friendlies. And had I not done that, I wouldn't be worried by how things have gone for Forest because results don't matter. But mm. looking at how sharp the other teams are looking already, Brighton, Liverpool, Arsenal. They they have got their systems of way of playing. They've slotted some new players in, and, and and it's business as usual. And they look very very sharp. Whereas with Forest, we we have struggled to get anything like a first eleven out. Mm. We've still got key injuries, and we haven't had we haven't strengthened in the areas goalkeeper, left back, central midfield. Those three areas were the three areas that going into the summer like they're the, they're the areas we need to strengthen. We haven't done that. We've signed Langer uh, in a position where we've already got a player like Brennan Johnson who can't necessarily get in the first 11 every week. And yet we've signed a Lango who will probably also fall into that bracket. So for me, we haven't yet signed a player that addresses one of the weak areas. And also when I've watched the games, we, we still look very negative. We still look almost like afraid of our own shadows, almost to show any kind of courage going forward. There was a bit of that at PSV when we went 1-0 down. We started to play a bit more, but it, it just seems like we're playing within ourselves at the moment. Um, it's pre-seasons. So you can't read too much into it. But if you've watched Brighton or Arsenal, it's worrying because they're not playing within themselves. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I agree. We, I haven't seen many of the games, but the formation is set up to be defensive. Unless you've got Gibbs White in the team and you've got Brennan in the team. No disrespect to Chris Wood, but... If you're going to play that, this box midfield, he's not necessarily... You want a one year up front. So that's what worries me um, go, I've, going into it. I do, but I do think... I think we're probably going to struggle those first three games or two of those first three anyway. And that's when the transfer window closes. So I'll mm. personally kind of judge it after that. And I thought we were saying before we started recording, I'll wait and see what other teams around us have done. Because I think we're going to be in that bottom eight clutch again. And n- none of them have particularly progressed for me this season i mean are you thinking we're going to be in that bottom third pretty much all season yeah i mean i'm I, i'm i'm a realist i think i'm I, I wouldn't say i'm pessimistic but i think that if if we make progress this season and that when i say progress that could be 15th i'll be over the moon with that really because for me it's again it's about um it's making sure we're cementing our status in the premier league and building on what we've got um we knew that 
there was going to be financial fair play issues this this season, but it's going to be even more next season. So I think consolidating and setting ourselves up to get through the FFP concerns that we might have next season, coming out of that and, and doing deals that get us in a solid position with FFP and then with a stronger side and settled as a Premier League team, that's got to be the objective of the next two seasons. So I think we can do that. I think that's within our grasp. And I think you're right. You're looking around at the likes of Wolves, um, Everton, uh, and obviously the teams that have been promoted. I don't think any of those worry me in terms of we're behind them. I think we're as good, if not better, than those sides. But um, it's 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 going to be a testing season again. I think it's going to be very familiar. I think we're going to go through some of the emotion that we went through last season. And I just hope that and I think it will. The support will be behind us like it was at the city ground. And I think that, again, will be so crucial. Yeah, I think so. I think we have to aim to finish kind of where... If we can aim for where Palace finish every year, and if we get to 15th, <laughs> that's, that's good for me. But without with this squad we have at the moment, and I, I assume we're going to sign a goalie, and I hope we're going to sign a central midfielder. Then mm. uh, Even if we don't get a left-back, I'm not totally panicked because... Uh, Ina doesn't look terrible and Williams can play there and do okay as, as a wing mm. back so I'm not panicked but yeah there's works to do right um, FPL and we've talked for 11 minutes on an FPL show without really getting into it um, we're going to talk about kind of at a level for people who play regularly but aren't necessarily drilling into numbers quite as much and hopefully that'll point them to black box and uh, get them more involved but for people who play regularly, in the, you know, we're all setting up our game week one drafts at the moment, and I, I'm tinkering with it like 10 times a day, I must admit, uh, based on any kind of form or injury news. But what are the kind of guiding principles for you to make sure you get off to a, a steady start each season? Well, it's funny, actually, if you spoke to me this time last year, and you did, um, I was very much more aligned to taking a few risks. I, I was... I'm kind of new to Twitter. An FBL on Twitter is is a thriving community. Mm. Um, I got back into Twitter mainly because I had the YouTube channel and we were on, you know, let's promote it on, on Twitter. Let's let's talk to people on Twitter and get get into the community. Um, and I was kind of like wary about how that would affect me as an FBL manager. And it kind of took me by surprise last season that this time of year I was looking at all the teams on Twitter and and – I kind of it, it affected me in that I pushed back deliberately against all the kind of teams that looked the same. So everyone had Salah, everyone had Jesus. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go against that. And I went with Son and Kane from the get-go. Uh, I didn't go Haaland. So I missed out on Jesus, Haaland and Salah, three players who ended up being very popular from day one. And I fell behind early on. Um, so this season, my approach is to kind of shut that noise out a bit. I'm aware now of how Twitter can affect me. So I'm kind of just picking a team, going back old school approach, which is to pick a team based on fixtures and difficulty of fixtures for teams. Um, I'm a big fan of data. So I, you know, I, I'm members of sites that allow me access to expected goal data and so on. And that's a lot about what Black Box is about. If you watch Black Box, you'll see us call on data and, and talk about our analysis of it and what it means and try and help people who are new to that. So I'm, I'm my, my approach is very old school. Fixtures being the, the most prominent influence then last season's data or last season's performance and then pre-season because I think results pre-season form pre-season you can go back season after season and look at players that did really well pre-season then when you bring them in they completely flopped so I don't want to put too much stock into that what you can get from pre-season though is systems tactics minutes you can get a read on the likely starters I would say that one of the, the golden rules is never go into the season with play with too many risks. If you look at a player and think he may or may not start, don't have too many of those. Try and limit that to one or maybe two at the most. Um, don't take too many risks on players new to the Premier League because they can look great pre-season, but that isn't necessarily going to translate to the season proper. Again, limit the number of those. And just look at fixtures because that's all we've got. That's the best indicator we've got of how the early fixtures will go is the difficulty of the fixtures. Talking of which, of course, we know how difficult Forest start is, which means Forest players probably aren't on my radar at the moment. No, true. I know what you mean about Twitter. It's kind of a, it becomes a herd mentality, doesn't it? You all end up gravitating to say, I'm trying 
I've sort of my, my my draft at the moment is quite like it. I really want to rally against it and have a maverick team. So you're doing it. So you're doing what I did last season. And I'm not good. And I don't think I will because I am a bit too conservative. Yeah, I don't think I will. You mentioned before. I've got a draft, and I'll put it up in a minute. Mm. You mentioned data. It's interesting. I was mm. quite a data skeptic before I played FPL, and I know Mikey who does this is, and I think Temps is, and I know Greg is. Uh, but oh, I've kind of, yeah, okay. yeah, I've, yeah. I do buy into it now, but mm. I don't think it's bulletproof because I think obviously like Man City are the perfect indicator last season. Their expected goals conceded is so low and then Edison faces one shot every game of those last 10 games and it just yeah. ended up in the back of the net. Did you have him, by the way? At the end I did for a spell, yeah. I had him famously for the uh, non-assist that he got against uh, Spurs when he took the goal kick. It, uh, it, it, yeah. um, Langley, it came off his leg and Malwes ran through and scored. And I was like, yes. So at least I got the assist and then it was never given and I was furious. And I I lost to As, obviously my great rival, by one point. Had I got yeah. that assist, I'd have beaten him. So Edison's got a place on in my kind of last season's Hall of Fame for all the wrong reasons. But yeah, he mm. was incredibly frustrating, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, I did. I mean, I ended up, I was on, I think I had Kepper and Raya, but I was like, I can't pick him. But I do take stock in data. I must admit, that was mm. going to be my question. I mean, what's the balance between fixtures, data, and watching games for you? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a golden question, really, even in FBL, because everyone approaches that differently. I think you've got to get to know yourself as a, <laughs> get to know yourself as an FBL manager, really, in terms of what is most influential for you and what works for you. Um, I, I like data. I like working with it. I, you know, I, I was well into Opta the minute that broke as some as a thing. And I was, you know, loved Opta Joe and so on and Duncan Alexander and all that. I love following them. And and so I was I took every opportunity I could to get into it and get find out how to use it to help me as an FBL manager. But I'm also wary of you can overuse it. And I I also swear by the eye test as well. I love spotting a player who perhaps um is suddenly been put in a new position or there's a new tactic and suddenly they come to the fore. I'm, if you look at players in the past season, like Gundogan, who ended up playing up front for City and was just went on an incredible run, right? No data would have predicted that. We didn't know that he was that kind of elite finisher. Given that position in City's team, he would get that many goals. Lingard's run of form for West Ham, if you remember that, and yes. I was on that. It was incredible. And, you know, that was, that was the form that got so excited when we signed him. And, that stuff you can't spot that you know so you need to be watching games and and see see where there's been tactical changes and system changes or where and some people don't believe this they don't they don't really believe in form being a thing but for me you can tell when a player has confidence and when he being a great example last season you know he he, he got that he got that goal and then he followed it with a series of braces and and suddenly at the end of the season he looked like he was going to score every time we got the ball in the box to him he he had that air of confidence about him that he'd lacked when he when he started the season before the injury so you know if you're perceptive if you trust your own ability to read players and read tactics and systems then watching matches is perhaps all you need mm. i like to back it up with data as well um but um yeah and and fixtures is yeah i'm i'm normally fixtures over form mm, yeah i think I, I yeah i always target fixtures myself right i've done it um a draft very quickly before I did this. And if people in my mini league, Mikey's brother, who watched this, this is not my team. This is put together. It's got three Forest players in it. Right. Um, so I'll read it out for people who are listening, not watching. And I think there's like two million in the bank uh, for this. So it could have had a stronger bench or um, obviously there's two six million midfielders or 6.5 for Gibbs White. So I'll read it out. Uh, Pickford in goal, Alexander Arnold, Stones and Gabriella across the back. And then a midfield of Saka, Rashford, who are both popular, uh, Gibbs, White and Johnson, who we'll discuss, Haaland, Awanyi and Watkins, and then a pretty standard bench with Ariola and Bell, who are popular, uh, Nakamba and Gurhi, because I like mm. Palace fixtures, personally. Um, so, before we get into the Forest players, are you... Um, on the pretty template, as we say on the, on Twitter, three five two, or are you tempted by three four three because it's historically the best formation. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm three five two at the moment just because the amount of value there is in in midfield, and I think if I was going to take a cheap attacking player, it would be up front rather than a cheap midfielder. But um, there's been a shift in you know before today, Darwin 
really had turned my head and I was looking at, well, maybe I should go Darwin, um, uh, Haaland, of course, uh, and Nakuku, uh, the Chelsea uh, midfielder who's been classed as a, as a forward in FBL, may well end up playing central uh, for Chelsea ahead of Jackson. So Nkuku and Haaland are very popular. Uh, Darwin, not so. But he was beginning to get traction because of the pre-season form he was showing. He's a player that I've always wanted to have on my FBL team and I'm looking for every opportunity to get him. And before today, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go with it, 4 3 free and have Darwin as well. But he didn't start today. And I kind of said to myself, if he didn't start the last couple of friendlies, then that was a sign that he would be too risky. So I'm moving back to 3 5 2. Um, but I, I mean, I like, you know, you've got Haaland and Watkins. A lot of people are ignoring Watkins because of the fixtures, but his fixtures, it's only Newcastle away that's tough. After that, he looks very strong. And I think Villa. Villa is a team that we will want to invest in as FBL managers. So I like that, certainly. Saka Rashford are in every team. Gabriel Stones are in every team. Trent is a dilemma, though. A lot of managers at the moment are going, can I go without Trent? What can I do without that? So, yeah, I like a lot of this team. Um, but the Forest players, definitely, there's question marks over them, isn't there? Um, and for people who are watching this and kind of just casually throw together a team, looking at game we want and not planning ahead how much stock do you put in price points to, you know, get an 8 million midfielder in, get a 6.5 million midfielder in, even if you don't really want the, that player, but it gives you a flexibility to move around. Are you particularly bothered by that or do you just go with what you think is best for those first couple of games? I think it can be important. I, I always say, though, don't com compromise on your team just to get flexibility. I think what you've got to do, you've got to look at your initial lineup and then you've got to, look at some scenarios that could happen. Um, if you've played FBL before, you know that the player prices can be a curse early on. The first half of the season is where player prices really accelerate and can get out of control. And there's nothing worse than being on the first Saturday and a player that you did look at pre-season has done really well and you know he's going to rise in price that evening and you're thinking, oh, no, do I make the transfer now before Sunday's matches have been played? even before, you know, the, 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 you've got a week to go before the next set of fixtures. You kind of, the prior prices can force your hand if you're not careful. And there's nothing worse than having to make two transfers to get a player. So say, I mean, I don't think this will happen, but say you don't go Darwin and you go looking at that team now, if you've got Haaland, Aaron, Ian Watkins, if Darwin gets a couple of goals at Chelsea, you know he's going to be incredibly popular because they're playing Bournemouth in game week two. So you could go Watkins to Darwin if you wanted to. That would be one move. So you could move that way quite easily. If you didn't have Watkins, if you had a cheaper striker, you'd be in trouble. So that's how you've got to look at it. You've got to pick your team and then look at some scenarios that might force your hand and consider how you would get to those players should that scenario happen. And, and yeah, I'm not talking unrealistic ones. I'm talking things that could happen. Players that you fancy that you don't commit to for game week one but you think that the minute they do show form, you will want them. Look at how you would move to them. Look at what it would take in terms of the numbers of transfers you'd have to do to get them. Yeah, I yeah. guess that's Trent and Salah for a lot of people. I would yeah, it could be. I'm just yeah. going to try and mess with the layout. We don't normally leave graphics up this long. Is that going to work? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, yeah. Oh, if I try and move you up there. No, I've just switched us around. Okay, <laughs> right. I'll take it off and I'll put it back up because... Uh -huh. um, Hang on. I can edit this. I probably won't edit this, to be honest. I'll probably just leave it in. Right, OK. Uh, we'll come back to that draft in a minute. The for yeah. In terms of Forest players who might be in it this mm. season, I mean, I think it's fair to say, as well as we're all Forest fans watching this, and we'd like to pick them, but it's very difficult at the start based on the fixtures, isn't it? It's horrific, that start, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's very weird the way it came out. It's like it's given us an incredibly hard run of away games, but it's almost like it's gone... But they're, they're a good side at home, so we'll give them the promoted teams at home to start. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's been hand-picked or something. It's very, very odd selection of fixtures. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Um, and it means that you I don't think you can go in for a Forest player unless they're a Forest player in rotation because I look at Gibbs White and think six million. If you're, if you're going to go five active midfielders, what I mean by active is midfielders that you wouldn't mind putting in your 11. Um, then Gibbs White, particularly Gibbs White and Matoma, if you look at the rotation between Brighton and Forest, mm. I think we go all the way to game week 18 or beyond with 
if you have Matoma and Gibbs White, you can get a home fixture out of one of them every week. Mm -hmm. And it's good fixtures as well. So the Brighton Forest rotation could work really well. If you want to go Gibbs White, if you're sold on it, then look at rotating with Matoma. Um, equally, like if we do sign a keeper and that keeper's Henderson, um, then the goalkeeper rotation with Brighton could work really well as well. So mm. Gibbs White is possible. I think a keeper, if it's Henderson, and particularly if it's Turner, of course, because he's four million, that that could work as well. Mm. Um, beyond that, I think it's I think it's difficult. Aaron e, I think from game week seven, our fixtures turn, and he could be, you know, hopefully he's he's fit by then. If he's not fit for the start of the season, he could be one to look at then. Brennan, we don't know, right? We don't we don't even know where he's going to be. So um, at six million, if he's starting every week from game week seven, he's going to be fantastic, but start the season i would rather i'd rather go gibbs white do you think i mean i'm sure morgan's gonna he's gonna end up in our teams at some point this season is he it feels like everything's geared for him to have a big season fpl wise and football wise yeah 17 returns last season um and i would say that he would build on that again and kick on and go into the 20s up to 25 maybe right so when you've got a six million pound asset in fbl who gets 25 somewhere between 20 and 25 returns, goals and assists. That's fantastic. And I think Gibbs White is capable of that if he keeps penalties, of course. Um, he only got them second half of the season. But also you think, I think he's he's growing as a player. We're not. He's got. He's still got his best years to come, certainly as, as a Forest player as well, in that he's you know settling into that team and the players around him. And he'll build new relationships. He's got that relationship already with Brennan. With Aaron E, we hope he'll build on that and new players coming in. I mean, I'm excited about what we're going to see from Gibbs White. And I think that's going to mean he's going to build on what we saw in terms of FBL returns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, to me, I think by the end of this season, if it goes well for us and for him, he's, I think he'll be in like that Madison category because he got a lot of returns for Leicester. And the, kind of the thing that if they scored a goal, there's probably a you know 40% chance Madison yeah. was involved. And I think Gibbs White will probably be that man for us. Um, what about Brennan as a midfielder? I remember last year you were really disappointed he was a forward. Mm. The fact he's a midfielder, actually, probably this year is worse for him because there's so many good midfielders, aren't there? There are. I think if if we... The, the worry with Brennan is, like, if he stays, then it's the away games. I don't know that he's in our 11 for the away games if we play um, the 3-5-1-1 uh, one, one, or 3-4-1-1, uh, one, one, rather. So I don't know if... Um, if that's going to be, you know, those four away games, I don't know how many of those he's going to start. The home games, yes, you can bank on him. But again, then it's a choice between Brennan or Gibbs White. And because of the, the set pieces and penalties that we think will be on Gibbs White, you'd favour Morgan. Brennan, um, there's no doubt, though, he's a, he's going to be a stronger source of goals than than, than Gibbs White, I think. Um, it's just really from game week seven when our fixtures turn, that's when the likes of Aaron e and Brennan will come into the equation, I think. And at six million, yeah. I mean, I, I would happily own two Forest attackers from game week seven because of the run yeah. we've got. So I think he's not he's not out of the equation by any means, but we need that run of fixtures. Mm. Is there anyone else in the squad that you think might emerge? I've got one name, but I'll see if you've got anyone who you think might be a factor as we progress. Um defensively it's tough isn't it because i think we'll we'll always favor the keeper um Danilo maybe um mm. depending on the role that he plays now i've talked about the formation away from home um i think that Danilo will be the midfielder charged with supporting you know if, if we play gives white and amani um Danilo will be the one who who joins them on the counter and most likely be found in the box on the counter and we saw last season at the end what, what a fantastic source of goals he became at the right time. So he's the one, I guess, in that he's a bit of a, a joker in the pack and that we don't really know what we're going to get with him. He was signed, I think, as a deep line yeah. playmaker, wasn't he? And mm -hmm. we've kind of seen him morph into a box-to-box -box midfielder and, and he, he can obviously finish and show composure. So he's kind of like a work in progress in terms of what is he? What is he going to be for Forrest? I don't think anyone can define it at the moment. No, I think he might. Best case scenario, FPL wise, he's sort of like a Jacob Ramsey type player. I think he was four four point five or five million, and he was quite useful. And it mm. went like obviously Villa's fixtures are really good, and I might end up with him and DRB and Watkins. But um, yeah, I think Danilo might be that man. I mean, last season 
We'll talk about backing against Forest last season, but did you pick any Forest players last season just because you really wanted someone in the squad, even though know, they didn't really merit it? Yeah, I had Brennan for quite a few spells, and I did all right out of him. I had him for the Leeds game and the, and the brace he got it against Everton. Um, I had him for a couple of games where he had a goal disallowed and only missed a penalty, so it was ups and downs with Brennan. Um, but yeah, I, I was on him a few times. I did okay with him. Um, I I did find it really hard last season as it was the first time Forrest and FBL have collided and it wasn't a very pleasant experience because Forrest come first and I don't like backing players against my team. And so I missed the Haaland hat-trick at the Etihad against Forrest, um, and which was obviously incredibly painful because I just didn't want to think about the prospect of of captain in Haaland against Forest, I had him, but I didn't captain him because I didn't want to back him to get a load of points against my team. And as it happens, he did, of course. But then the reverse of that, when Forest obviously kind of transformed into a team that could hold their own and find a way and Cooper's tactics, we were beginning to, I guess we kind of turned into a team that was results driven rather than the team that started the season, which we, I think we went into it with a kind of more naive approach. We wanted to be a bit more expansive and we quickly changed to a team that were talking were managing games. And when City came to the City ground, I didn't captain Haaland, I captained Rashford instead. And yet the majority of FPL managers got on Haaland captain and Rashford mm. got a big haul that day. And Haaland, of course, Felipe kept him in his back pocket. So, you know, some some occasions it worked for me and some occasions um, in the end of the season, uh, start of the season rather, it went against me. So it was a bit of a roller coaster in itself, but it wasn't nice. The, the kind of the, the the conundrum of do I back these players because I think they're the right FBL players, but then I'm kind of backing Forest to get beaten by a, a big margin if I do that. It's not an easy thing to to handle. No, I did it. <laughs> I did. I felt it's a bit of heart versus head, isn't it? I mean, in my heart, mm. I just see Forest getting results in just about every game, but in reality, I you know, I captained. I think I captained Jesus at the Emirates and I got Fernandez and uh, loaded up on United because we just couldn't do anything against them when they came to our place. We only lost 2 0. And uh, yeah, I didn't mind targets. Well, I didn't want to target Forrest, but I did do it. And I was generally pretty good with captaincy last season. I didn't mind backing against Haaland when it felt right. And I think I might have done it. No, I definitely captained him both times against Forrest, but. You mentioned captaincy. I mean, for people who don't play too much, it's so central to the game, isn't it? Is it is it just going to be Haaland captain, you know, every single week for you this season, do you think? I hope not. I, I, I think that, that Haaland's come in and broken that mechanic um, because obviously it's it's too risky to, to look at another player. Um, I think we've got, you know, people who have Salah from the start will back Salah against Bournemouth rather than... Harland at home to Newcastle, but that suddenly looks like a gamble, which is, seems ridiculous. Um, so, unfortunately, I think Harland has has kind of made the decision almost a no-brainer. I, I hope, I mean, last season we saw Rashford come to the fore, second half of the season, and I did a lot better in the second half when suddenly you had to think about the captaincy and there was a chance that you could steal a march by being brave with the captaincy. And Harland didn't always deliver, as we saw at the city ground. So, um I hope that it doesn't continue to be like that. I think the season will start like that. I think six out of seven game weeks, everyone will catch in Haaland. Yeah, I think I will definitely. I, I, I was on Saka when, was it Southampton or something? Mm. I can't remember. He got, his, he got a big haul and that, that really helped. But then I really, uh, what went wrong? Oh, the last game week, I catch in Salah, not Kane, and that went wrong. And um, there was Wilson versus Isaac, not as captain oh. necessarily. And I was on Isaac, and that cost me my mini league, I think. That's yeah. one of the things about FPL, isn't it? I mean, one of the first questions I was going to ask you is, why do we love it? But also, we can hate it at times, can't we, when those marginal 50-50s that you agonise over go wrong? Yeah, I mean, I it's ups and downs. I think you, the, 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 the mentality of playing FPL is, is become quite a key component. You've got to be quite resilient to play it because um, – it's very easy to let it into your life to the point where actually it affects your moods. I mean, I know more than anyone. I mean, it used to be my way of life, my living, right? So if I, if I had a bad game week, I had to go on camera, you know, representing the Premier League, talking to people about it when they knew that I'd had a stinker. And it, so when I had a bad game week, it 
I was like, oh, God, I'm dreading Monday morning. Like, no one has to think about that. They go to work and forget it. It might get teased a bit. But for me, I had to live it every day. So it got into my mindset of, like, I've got to learn to handle this, right? When I have a bad game week, it doesn't affect my mood. So you've got to be careful. You've got to be not – don't let it into that extent. Try and keep it healthy. Try and – and I think, in a way, Forrest helped me with that last season. While there was conflict – I always, my emotions were always governed by how Forrest got on and not by how my FBL team got on. And that's the first season for years and years and years, well, since I played FBL, where that's been the case. And so I enjoyed that aspect that suddenly it wasn't FBL that was affecting my mood, it was Forrest. And, and that's been, you know, I don't mind that so much. What's your mentality heading into this season? Because um, all the, there's a whole crop of YouTube content creators. Mm. And I watch you guys, I'll recommend a couple of others. Um, I watch Scoutcast. I watch Burning Questions, which has just changed the hosts. I think that's really good. And I watch a bit of FPL Wire as well. And there's a there's a clutch of others who do the shorter 15 minute videos. Mm. And you're all grappling for attention. And you all say, "Oh, I've got four top 10k finishes." And so, how much does you know? How much does that pressure to get a good rank play on you? Is it as as that dwindled a bit now over the years? Yeah, as for me, I think I've got a long. A, a, a long kind of it's not a career but well, it was but it isn't now yeah. but a long history in fbl so I've, i'm lucky enough to have quite a few good finishes behind me to the point where i can get away with a few bad seasons luckily because i've had a few bad seasons without people going oh i'm not listening to this guy people who know my history and so on um so i it doesn't doesn't drive me as much as perhaps some of the others i think if i was you know just starting my channel up and i i wasn't a known person in the community and hadn't had the long history of, with the game that i've had it would get to me yeah so i'm quite thankful that i'm in that position where i can relax a bit and play it without worrying about oh what are people going to think that i haven't got a really good rank so it doesn't affect me that much but again it, it goes back to what i said is like you've got to you've got to control you know, the, the mental side of playing the game because that can that can really you know get to you a bit if you have a bad week and you're you see your rank plummet and also it starts affecting your decision making. You start making decisions not based on what players you think are going to do better, but what players you think you need to get. Because if you don't get them, then everyone else has got them. So your rank's going to drop. And suddenly it's not about a game about who scores the most points. It's about playing, you know, almost playing a meta game within the game of, oh, that player's 80% owned, so I better sign him. I don't think he'll do well, but I need to get him. Yeah. That, that, that kind of butts against my principles of playing the game. I like to play for fun. And sometimes when you're playing for rank, it's hard to play that way. You forget that it is meant to be fun. Mm -hmm. What's your highest finish for a humble brag? I'll give you a free open goal. Uh, 42. I came 42nd. Um, and then and then the season that I was on the TV show, because I worked for the Premier League and I was on the FBL show, which didn't go out in the UK, but it went out in other territories. Um, they were like, oh, here's our fbl expert and i was like oh my god i better do well i came 115th in the world so i was absolutely delighted because obviously i was like oh everyone's going to get me if i do really badly but that was my second best season so i was very fortunate to get that season under my belt and then obviously from that point on people were like oh yeah okay he does know what he's doing so it's all right yeah bear in mind i mean for people who watch there's like 11 million people i, I don't know it probably wasn't as high when you no, it was about five but... million yeah, it was they're not bad. The top. Yeah, that's all. I'll take it. I'll definitely take that again. I don't know if those <laughs> days will ever come back. I think my best days are behind me. But I, I like I say, I play it for fun. I play it to do things like this. And and I've met a lot of great people in the community. Um, I I'm part of a team that put on a, a, a fancy football fest every year. That's coming up um, on on the Friday, it's the first day of the season in in, in London. And we get together with you know, there'll be about 300 other fancy football managers there it sounds like geek hell but it's actually real fun because you're with <laughs> people who are obsessed with football and obsessed with fancy football and i love being around people who who like fancy football they tend to be you know great football supporters who i have a lot in common with and it's um yeah it's good i, I enjoy what it brings to the game but it's still forest first so um yeah we'll see how the conflict goes in this season um before we wind down are you looking forward to fpl more this season i mean i'm speaking for me here i found the second half of last season well the, probably the last six or seven game weeks a bit dull because everyone veered to the same players my rank didn't really move i feel like hopefully this season the pricing i think the pricing is a bit better yeah. and i think i'm hoping it's gonna be a really enjoyable season this year 
I don't know how you feel about it. I hope so. I think you're right. I think that um, it felt like we were standing still for quite a bit of last season. Um, the mm. Harlan captaincy, of course, as we've talked about. And then I think there was a point in the season where it was really hard to make any progress. I think it gets to the point where when wild cards are played in the second half season, every team is more or less the same and you can't make up ground and you you don't want to take too many risks because you're going against established players like Salo or Haaland and that can be too risky at times. But I think this season I'm hoping with the pricing, it's a little bit better. It, you know, the, the big names are expensive and there's a lot of, lot of possible players like Chelsea are coming alive again. Spurs, you know, with 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 Son, if if Kane leaves or Charleston could be a factor. So with the Chelsea players, with the likes of a Charleston, and um, Brighton have got another season behind them. I I just think that the Villa are, are kicking on as well. I think there's more players available now who could break into our teams and and the kind of cookie cutter teams that we see at the start of the season. Hopefully, will break up a bit and it'll be more varied. And um, I'll put our draft up quickly before we go again. I mean, apart from the obvious like Harland. And I guess Saka, mm. for people who are building a team, uh, and uh, you know, play play casually, but might give up after five or ten weeks. Are there two or three kind of names that you recommend that you think well, you really do need these in your team this season? You haven't, yeah, you haven't got any Brighton. I, I don't like Brighton long term, but I do like them short term because of the start they've got Luton and Wolves. So I, I think yeah, Estupian is is going to be very highly owned at the back. So I, I think having him is probably worthwhile to start. Obviously, have what I would call an exit plan, so a move to come off him to another player in game week three or four. Um, I think that um, having Trent might be problematic. Chilwell, you haven't got yet. I think Chilwell could be the player to bring in there and get you a bit more money you can spend elsewhere. Chilwell looks to have started, looks to be played very strongly in pre-season. And yes, you can't read into form, but it's just the fact he's got forward so much. It just seems Pochettino's system gives him that space to get forward and we know what he can do in the final third. I think he can deliver. So I think Chilwell is a player that I would definitely get into this team and at the start of the season, I think he, he should be a popular player and so look to get him in. Other than that, you know, I think there's, there's so much choice there and you've got the basis of a really strong team here, but I would just go... Trent to chill well, get a bit more money, strengthen the bench up. Going in with a weak bench is troublesome because if you get an injury going week one, you're then forced into a transfer. So you don't want to be that. You want to mm. ideally save a transfer. So you go into game week three with two transfers and then it gives you a bit more flexibility. Do you always recommend a cheap keeper? Because I think a lot of people are always drawn to Edison and historically Allison because you always assume they'll get the most points. And they probably generally do, but do you think actually it's better to save the money and go for a 4.5 million keeper as, as a rule? Yeah, I do. I like to have like two 4.5 keepers in rotation. So you could go Pickford and Leno, for example. I think Ariola could be a gift though, because he, he could start for West Ham at 4 million. I think the Pickford Ariola combination is good here. Uh, I don't think there's too much reason to change that. I would go up to Anana um, at, at United because I just think that, you know, coverage of the United defence is worth having and Anana at five million is, is cheap. Obviously we'll start. I, I think he will he will get a decent I think he'll get close to competing with Allison and Edison, who are five five. So either go a four five and a four million or go Anana would be my tip in goal. Mm. I do, I did have Anana in my real draft and I've I've gone off him, but I am tempted to go back just to get the money in. Um back to Forest just quickly. I mean, we've got Brennan in our team here with your mm. Forest fan hat on. Do we have to keep him or would you maybe sell him and redistribute the funds to, you know, strengthen where we are weak as a fan? What would you like to see? Well, at Forest, outside of FBL. Yeah, real real actual football. Yeah, I think that um, <laughs> real football. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't like to lose his goals that he, he brought to us last season. He, you know, he, he he won us the Leeds game. He got us the point against Everton. There were, there were many games where he was the, the thing that, that that got us the points um, until Aaron E took over at the end. So I I worry about losing him because we're, we're taking the goals out of the team. And Alango is not, he's not a like for like in that respect. Yeah, I don't think he's in the same realm in terms of finishing ability, composure and so on. Maybe he will get there, but he's not there at the moment. 
So I worry about the goals going, um, but I do also think that if there is FFP concerns, which obviously we have no view on, we don't know if that is the case, and we need to do that business to strengthen in player in positions like goalkeeper and central midfield, then 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 I think it's a move that I I, I would accept. I would accept if we strengthen in those areas. I think it would I'll be gutted because when the season ended, I was immediately looking forward to this season and thinking, oh, we can watch Gibbs White and Brennan and Awane grow as players and what could they become? And it's always exciting when you've got a homegrown player that you, you can watch develop. So I'd be gutted to lose that. I'd be gutted to lose his goals, but I'm realistic in thinking that if we do it, it'll be for the right reasons, which will probably be to invest elsewhere. Yeah, I'd be very reticent to sell without getting another striker in. I just think... If a one year gets injured and we don't have Brennan, then where are the goals coming from? Because he mm. can't rely on Elanga, who I do think is a good signing and mm. a long term, a lot of long term potential. But you, you know, Chris Wood isn't as bad as everyone says, but he, I don't think he's going to get. He might if he has a good season, a really good season, get ten goals, and that's a good season. So we're just relying on Gibbs White, and that would worry me if we don't mm. sign a centre forward. And if you're signing a centre forward, a good one. Then, yeah, Chris Wood costs 15 million quid. A really good centre forward is going to cost 30 million quid, and we're selling Brennan for 40. So, where's the money going to go? We can't sell him for 40. I, 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 I think that, you know, if we if we keep him for another season, what's he going to be worth this time next year? He, yeah. he, he's going to be worth 50 before we even start a conversation, isn't he? Because he's going to, he's going to do what he did last season, if not more, and his reputation is going to grow. So, I, I guess we don't know what's going on behind the scenes with FFP. Mm. And I guess, you know, we're looking at it and going, can we get the money now or should we leave it a season? I don't I don't know. I, it's speculation, but I think I'd want 50. I'd want 50 because I think we'll easily get 50 this time next year. Yeah. I think if you can kick the can down the road for a season and then we become like Leicester and sell one big player every summer, that would probably work better. But at this stage... I, I, I don't want to become like Leicester. Cause <laughs> no. No, I know what you mean. But like this time a year ago, I think Fletch said on here, Forrest did two summer transfer windows in one summer and there was going to be, uh, you know, a, a price to pay for that. Yeah. I was kind of hoping the price would be we have to sell fringe players for knockdown fees. But I don't think we've been able to, well, we haven't been able to do that really, have we? I mean, the shelf is still here. Dennis is still here as it stands. Mm. So we'll see. Um, right. As we're recording this, Forrest playing Wren. So hopefully their pre-season's really sparked into life and we'll come off here and they're 4 up at half-time. And if they're not, I probably will edit this bit out. But in the meantime, there you go. Uh, Mark, just give us one more final plug for where people can catch you on Twitter and YouTube and everything. Yeah, so um, you can catch us on FBL Black Box on, on YouTube. If you just look that up, you'll, you'll find us straight away. Um, I'm on Twitter. i still got the FFS Scout um, uh, handle. So FF Scout underscore Mark is my Twitter handle. And... Um, before I go, just one message to Greg Mitch. It's on. Come on. He fancies himself, doesn't he, on NFBL? So <laughs> let's, let's, let's see it. Yeah, I know. I'm up for it. Come on. Uh, do you know, someone, um, a lad called Matt Taylor, who's a mate of Greg, was trying to get me to start an FBL podcast with Greg as me as the serious player and him as the, the joker. But I just, with, with young kids and a, a proper job, I just not enough time, but maybe next season see how greg goes this season i mean he was like i think he genuinely needed captain navas in one game and i think it was one where he kept a clean sheet it might have been the leeds game on his debut or something like that proper right. taking a punt on someone but but, he, yeah. but he's not a rookie now apparently that's how he said on twitter so um, i'm expecting big things from mitch so we'll see uh, so, yeah hopefully so hopefully so right uh we'll leave it there and we'll be back uh middle of next week i think with our full preview it's really hard to arrange getting everyone together but we'll do our season predictions then and we should have one more guest um interview before the season kicks off in the meantime uh, mark thanks very much uh do keep up the good work in fpl and hopefully we'll get you back on here just as a fan talking about forest in general lovely thanks thanks a lot matt it was a pleasure as always Yes, uh, thanks very much for the insight on FPL. Do listen to Mark, don't listen to me. Uh, have a good few days, everyone, and we shall see you soon.